So let's go start off. What is transaction replacement? And yeah, maybe not the best uh, screen, but this is a screenshot of the Bitcoin wallet, um, blue wallet, and it shows off transaction replacement very nicely. I have a transaction. I got rid of $25 worth of Bitcoin, and I can do two things. I can go bump the fee or the cancel the transaction. And if you have any, any of you guys have played around with it, well, it does what it expects. It increases the fee or it cancels it. And from a technical point of view, this is pretty simple. If you have a transaction, it's unconfirmed. You make another transaction spending at least one of the same inputs. And for technical reasons, if you ever implement a wallet, you want to spend all of them. But, you know, at least one. That means that transaction could also be mined. And thus, if that other transaction does things like, say, you know, increases the fee or makes all of the inputs now go back to you, you've achieved the goal of, you know, bumping the fee or canceling the transaction. Pretty simple. Um, other things people like to do with replacement is being all fancy and, you know, taking multiple outputs as they come in on an exchange and adding them together to optimize the fees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the history of this, I think, is actually kind of interesting, which is, well, Bitcoin 0 0.1.0 actually did ship with transaction replacement. This is not a new thing. And that's the code, I didn't bother looking up 0.1.0, but that's code from 0.1.5 for how it actually, you know, checks for a conflict and in the mempool acceptance and it does all its thing, looks at the outputs, et cetera, et cetera. But the key thing is, my next slide, what, when did it decide to replace one transaction with another? Well, it used something called the n-sequence field, which we don't really understand like quite why it was introduced. It's just a 32-bit number. And it said, well, if the number is bigger, go replace. Now, it's a 32-bit number, which means you could replace 4 billion times. And this was a really bad idea. You know, you could go sit there starting at zero and then just spam the, you know, the mempool of all nodes four billion times using up bandwidth for no particular reason. It was a dumb idea. But apparently, and this is my current making claims, and we don't really know if this is totally true, but supposedly Satoshi way back in the day thought you'd implement payment channels with this by having transactions hanging around in the mempool that could get mined but aren't yet, and then like someone would eventually go and make them mind. But there's a lot of problems with this, and you know I'll let you go think of uh, some of them, but uh, needless to say, this got yanked, and we came up with a much better idea, which is called replace by fee. And the way it does it is very simple. More money is better than less money. Now, there's a couple more rules, which I'll also mention later, but that really is all there is to it. It's if the transaction has a higher fee, you know, put the one in with a higher fee in. Seems really, really simple, right? This, I'm not exactly sure whose idea it was. It might have been mine, it might have been someone else's, but this like dates back to like 2013 or so. And at the time, mempools weren't congested and all, but people could go and foresee, like obviously this could be an issue and this seems like a good thing to have. Well, there's a catch, which is people don't like transaction replacement because part of Satoshi's original implementation as a byproduct we end up having something called the first seen rule, which is, as it suggests, the first transaction you go see, it's the one you go mine. Simple as that. Well, why is this useful? Well, if you want to go and pay for coffee with Bitcoin to an extremely unimpressed looking barista who's probably annoyed at all these stupid Bitcoiners, you can do that. Now. This gets back to like the block size debate and you know, as we all know, paying for coffee with Bitcoin, it doesn't really work that well. Like the blocks, you know, there's not that much block space out there and so on, but you know, that's the kind of, the politics around this. And you know, even up until now, there's still some people trying to accept unconfirmed transactions with the first scene rule. I keep on trying to find examples of this and having a very hard time to actually get good examples. Um, ATMs are something people often bring up, but you know, I was in El Salvador recently and supposedly the ATMs there would accept unconfirmed transactions and just spit out money. Well, half the time they would, half the time they wouldn't. And whether or not I'd set this BIP 125 thing didn't seem to matter. Speaking of, so what was the political compromise? How did we get transaction replacement in? Well, it's this thing, which I'm co-author of. It's BIP 125, and there's more to this BIP than this, but the key thing that allowed 
transaction replacement get in was this part, explicit signaling. Transactions considered to be in opted in to allow replacement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if the end sequence number is, you know, less than some value. So this is kind of in the spirit of Satoshi's harebrained idea. We're still using end sequence, but, you know, now we're letting people, like, opt into this. Of course, it's not that hard to replace a transaction whether or not it's been opted in, but, you know, that was the, that was the political compromise. And this other rule here, inherited signaling, that basically means, well, if you have a transaction in the mempool, then you spend it again. So you have two unconfirmed transactions. It's supposed to be that the second one can be directly replaced. And long story short, it's not actually implemented. So if you ever read the BIP, that part isn't true. But moral of the story is we got transaction replacement in. It is actually used um, you know, with this opt-in thing. And that's all well and good. Um, you know, my own open timestamps calendars use it to go get optimal fees. And as a byproduct, to go update, you know, the Merkle tree of transactions are timestamping. So they start off at the minimum possible fee, and every time a new block comes in, which is an indication the fee was too low, they double spend it with a higher fee, and a higher fee, and a higher fee, and eventually gets mined. You know, it's a pretty good technique if you want to pay the minimum possible price and are willing to wait. So this got in like 2016, if I remember correctly, and nothing much happened for years until... Multi-party transactions. So what's the issue here? Well, ne you know, as the years passed by, people started having the clever idea of, well, let's do protocols where multiple people author transactions. And the issue there is, and I'll give a coin join as an example. You know, if you and I create a coin join, both our inputs are in that transaction, but if you go and accidentally or intentionally double spend that input, if you broadcast that transaction first, it could get to majority or even essentially all miners. And then it's just going to sit there if it's a low fee. And now on my end, I have my coin join, but you know, nothing really happens. And I'm kind of stuck. I mean, I don't really know how do I make the coin join pro, you know, progress forward. Do I spend a higher fee? Well, it won't work because if you don't set this BIP 125 opt-in, I still can't replace your transaction. You know, I'm just waiting for you to finally time out or something happens. And there is no, like, set time limit for how long a transaction can sit around in mempools. I mean, in theory, it could sit around for months. You know, there's a thing called transaction expiry, but transaction expiry, because mempools are, of course, a, you know, a per node thing, if a transaction expires from your mempool, some asshole can just go and rebroadcast it again and get it back into your mempool, and then the two weeks goes on again. Like, there, there's no clear solution to this. So, finally, after all these years, people said, well, why don't we just go and add full replace by fee? Why don't we just say, screw this opt-in thing? Why don't we just do the transaction replacement rules for any transaction? Seems simple enough. As you can see here, uh, Marco here thought, looks good to me, should be controversial, given that the default is unchanged, it remains false. Right, simple enough. And on top of this, and uh, where is it? Maybe I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this was back in June th um, 13th of this year. And I think this got merged, what, two or three months later? And on top of this, people also had very oth other versions of these proposals. But, you know, that was the basic idea. Seems simple enough. Well, now we get a bit of a panic. Suhas goes and realizes, hang on a second. There's this transaction pinning thing, like it won't really work properly, you know, we should go remove it. And frankly, I and, you know, a few other people said, well, screw this. You know, we've been trying to get full replaced by fee in for 10 fucking years. I think it's time to get this in. And long story short, this is one of the most knacked pull requests in Bitcoin Core history. And it eventually did get closed. So, what on earth was Suhas talking about? Well... There's this thing called pinning attacks. Now, again, if you and I have a protocol where I might want to replace an unconfirmed transaction, and you might not want that to happen because you're just being mean, there are things you can go do by exploiting the BIP-125 rules. And the, this is the full set, at least in the BIP, of what the rules really are for when one transaction should, should be replaced by another. Um, you know, this is the rule number one is a bit about the end sequence opt-in, 
Rule number two is something we kind of added to make it easier to reason about, to make sure miners, like, you know, if, if I replace a transaction that then depends on a transaction that's really big, it's arguably not as good for miners, and that might make things be slower, and it's not instance compatible. You know, rule number three, it's a similar kind of deal where, well, if the replacement doesn't pay at least all the fees of the other transaction, I mean, maybe you can go spam the mempool with this. And frankly, when this was introduced, like a lot of these rules were just things I kind of came up with, well, you know, why don't we go and make sure this is conservative and won't be problems. Similarly, the replacement must pay for its own bandwidth. That's just saying, well, you can't replace for like one extra Satoshi. You've got to replace for at least, you know, the minimum relay fee times the size. And then number five, well, you're not allowed to replace more than 100 transactions at once. And between the you know, between these, like three and five are the main ones that allow pinning to work. Because if I don't want, you know, again, let's suppose we're in this coin join. You want to go and make my coin join sit around forever. If you just take your input and broadcast a chain of 100 transactions, Bitcoin Core instances is running these defaults. We'll say, hang on a second. I can't, you know, we're not going to replace one with the other because that's 100 and that's just too much. Now, is this 100 limit, like, is there a reason for it? Well, not really. I mean, it's a number we kind of pulled out of thin air. Like, obviously it was a million. There may be issues, but this really gets down to implementation. Like, how exactly does, does all this work, you know? But that was Suhas's idea. Since transaction pinning is a problem, well, obviously we should just go yank full RBF and come up with something better. Now, I would argue this is not really true. And it really gets back to cost. Now, if we're doing a coin join and someone accidentally does a double spend, like maybe they've imported the same seed into two different wallets at once, well, full RBF helps a lot. And let's go through why. So there's a couple scenarios. First of all, you might have double spent with a transaction that is more desirable to miners. So the coin join transaction can't replace that first one. You know, it doesn't pay as much as fees. Well, yes, the coin join gets canceled, but we still make forward progress because the double spend eventually gets mined, potentially quite quickly. And that's good, right? Like, the reality is coin join protocols like Wasabi, um, Join Market, and so on, those protocols fail all the time because they tend to be two-phase protocols. You know, a bunch of people, they propose inputs to the coin join, then they propose outputs. If they don't propose the output for the input, the coin join just fails and you try again. And, you know, apparently Wasabi, they've achieved the amazing success of having 25% of coin join attempts succeed. <laughs> you know, it doesn't sound like much, but be honest, when uh, I was told this, I was assuming it was like 1% or 2%. So, you know, that, that's better. But now let's go and look at the case where the double spend isn't as attractive. It's a lower fee. Well, if it's a lower fee, the coin join's just going to replace it, and the vast majority of miners are going to have this transaction, and we make forward progress by getting the coin join mined. Nice and simple. Now, let's go look at the scenario where someone's trying to maliciously stop the coin join. Well, how do they do this? Well, if they don't want to spend money, they have to broadcast a pinning transaction that pays low fees. Now, without full RBF, they can just broadcast any transaction at the minimum possible fee to send the mempool. And it's not clear when that will get mined. I mean, maybe never. Maybe, you know, the mempool minimum fee goes up and the transaction gets kicked out and now they can use those coins in some other way. I mean, there's a lot of ways that could, could, could go work. With full RBF, Provided they paid less in fees, it will get replaced with the exception of pinning attacks. You know, that sounds bad, but let's just go look at this rule. You know, this is the only, rule number five is the only rule that's really relevant in this type of pinning attack. The total of 100 transactions. Well, if I'm forcing the attacker to create 100 transactions in a row, they're tying up more money, and also if it's a fee that's high enough to get mined in a reasonable amount of time, which is what it would take to not get replaced, well, now they're paying 100 times more money when it does get mined. So frankly, long story short, I think Suhas is wrong on this. I think he 
just hasn't considered through how the tax really work. Because, you know, again, the, these things are coin join, you know, in the case of coin joins or, you know, lightning um, opens, all these attacks are things where I can also attack by just not, f not fully participating in the protocol. You know, again, coin joins are particularly vulnerable to this because they're two-phase protocols, but if all I do is just have a bunch, you know, create a bunch of outputs and DOS attack people by, you know, advertising those outputs, and refusing to go along with protocol, I've also wasted time. So we just have to do better than this, and full RBF does. Now, <laughs> so I know a lot of people on the Bitcoin dev discussion and so on around full RBF have been trying to frame this as a technical discussion. You know, they say, well, this is something that should be held to technical debate and so on. And, I mean, they're not entirely wrong. Like, obviously, if full RBF was something insane, well, maybe you would have a technical debate about this. But the technical debate is done. You know, we know it's a rule that works. We know there's no, like, technical issues with this. What's really happening now is this is a political debate. This is about trade-offs between different users of Bitcoin. And one of these trade-offs is privacy, for instance. You know, this opt-in flag is a privacy problem for everyone because you add one more bit of information to de-anonymize wallets. You know, you have another trade-off where wallet authors now have to go deal with people sending money without the opt-in flag and getting their coins stuck because the mempool's full. And again, that's a trade-off. Like, there's no clear technical consensus on what's better or not. That's, well, what do you value more? You also get really nutty stuff like, well, Craig Wright saying if a node allows double spend and mines it, you know, we should go sue them. And this nonsense, well, I hate to say it, but I'm personally being sued by Craig Wright. And I would rather, you know, first the first scene rule not be yet another thing people can go start suing people over. Like, it sounds silly, but, you know, back in like 2015, 2016 or so, I remember talking to people, you know, trying to get the first scene rule to go work reliably, who were proposing things like getting, you know, colluding with miners to, for instance, make sure that blocks that did do double spends got reorged out, which is insane. Like, the Bitcoin protocol can't be decentralized, yet also have a list of, you know, what is or isn't the valid transaction seen in mempools. You know, there just isn't consensus over Gossip over gossip networks. We just have to accept that. But one of the political trade-offs is people will try to go do these things if they build businesses on it. And, you know, this is the kind of outcome that can happen. And other people in Bitcoin can say, well, screw this. We're just going to sabotage your business from the get-go so it doesn't get big enough that it matters. You know, it's, I mean, it's kind of ugly there, but, like, that's one of the political trade-offs involved there. You know, another example of... Uh, political trade-offs is between just, of course, on the other side, I mean, some people do try to build businesses around this. There's also, uh, you know, people who try to build business around Lightning. I mean, can you really, from a technical point, say that one is much more valid than the other? You kind of can, but that's not really how this plays out. You know, it's, I'd, I'd argue it's much like the block size debate, where it's not like one or the other is clearly better, but there are trade-offs between them, and we chose to use second-layer protocols rather than make things better for on-chain protocols. So, you know, that is what it is. So, if you agree with me, how do you actually make it go happen? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty obvious thing to do. In uh, Bitcoin uh, version uh, 0 0.24.0, you add that to Bitcoin.conf, and you'll start, you know, applying full RBF. Simple as that. Um, if you use Bitcoin Nots, since I think it's about three or four years ago, Luke told me. But anyway, like Bitcoin Knots has had full RBF enabled for a couple of years now by default. Um, there's, you know, also you could go patch it yourself if you really wanted to, although I don't really see why. But that's, that's the basics of it. Now, there's been a nuance here, though, which is you enabling that flag doesn't mean you necessarily have peers who also do this. And there's two sides to this. First of all, if you're running a listening node that is reachable from the rest of the internet, and you run full RBF, 
people can go and make sure full RBF transactions propagate to you by just connecting to every node. And on, you know, IPv4, like of IPv4 nodes as an example, there's only about 5,000 or so listening nodes. Running a beefy server that literally just connects to every single node at once is completely feasible. You know, that, that side of the propagation issue is easy to solve. I think the more interesting thing is what happens when someone turns on a node that isn't accepting incoming connections? What is the chance that they wind up connecting to one of these full RBF nodes? Well, that's your math for it. Your probability is, you know, basically the probability of if you have, so let's say you have M full RBF nodes out of N total nodes in, t out of N total nodes in that category. What is the probability of all eight not being full RBF? And of course, you know, I inverted there. Well, that's, that's your graph. Um, percentage of, R not on x-axis, percentage of full RBF nodes, y-axis probability of having at least one. And as you can see, it gets to like 50-50 pretty quickly. It takes like 8% of nodes running full RBF for there to be a 50-50 chance of at least one. And for you know, out of like 5,000 IPv4 nodes, that's like 400 nodes. As far as I can tell, Bitcoin knots, because it's by default, has actually already like gotten us like something like halfway there, maybe more. So it won't take that many more people turning it on to make propagation happen fairly reliably. Um, another example of this is Blockstream.info recently turned on mempool for, for RBF on the backend nodes for their um, well, you know, for their website. It doesn't always work, but a lot of the times it does. And if you hit control R, because it actually, you know, because the web interface actually connects something like 10 different ones, you'll see, you know, what percentage are actually connected at one time. And I'm, I'm talking to them to go fix up the propagation issues. And there's also an easy way to guarantee this, which is preferential peering. Now, if you're familiar with how services are advertised on the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, well, there's something called the end services field. And that's a bit mask of all the services you offer. Well, I have a long-standing patch. Um, the code in this particular case was written by someone else, but I've, uh, um, you know, adopted it for version 24. And basically, this code advertises a full RBF bit and ensures that at least four of your peers are full RBF peers. Long story short is if you run this, you'll reliably get full RBF um, propagation. It's quite helpful if people do this because it means that you, you, know, you don't have to go brute force it as much. It's a very elegant thing. And interestingly, Bitcoin Knots, when it does run full RBF, it advertises this bit too. It doesn't do the preferential peering part, but it does, it does advertise it. So again, this is another way where you can ensure that all these different nodes are interconnected. And finally, of course, obviously, Miners need to actually go run this, although not as much as you think. So if you get situations where, say, the mempool is full, as you may know, transactions below the, you know, below the, like, when the mempool is full, you know, we sort all the transactions by fee paid, and we drop the lower ones, and that's how you keep it in check. Well, one of the side effects of this is it means that Doing double spends is easy, and having more full RBF nodes makes it more likely to get to miners who happen to have dropped it. But obviously, if miners just go run this, you know, period, full RBF replacements can get mined. And with that, I hope you're doing your part too. <laughs> Thank you. I assume we have time for questions. I do actually. Um, I'm not going to say who until they until I see them have evidence of it actually happening. But I've been talking to them on and off, and uh, well, for the past couple of weeks, and uh, it was literally like what an hour ago that they told me uh, they'd forgotten to go restart their nodes when they turned the switch on. So, <laughs> well, y you know, it happens. So uh, we we might see uh, a replacement pretty quick, and um, you know, my open timestamp system. I remember, you know, earlier I said how. Um, the 
open timestamps calendars do opt-in replacements? Well, there are four of these calendars in total, all doing timestamp transactions independently, and I run two of them. And on the two I'm running, I've changed it so that it does full RBF replacements. So if you go to uh, alice.btc.calendar at opentimestamps.org or bob.btc.calendar at opentimestamps.org, you can go see this um, firsthand. And you know any of the like you know any of the transactions that it does in the chain, they are full RBF replacements. And eventually, at some point, one of them will get mined. You know, it's just a matter of time. Also, on the Alice one, I've um, upped the fees to basically you know perform a bounty. So anyone running full RBF or potentially screwing with mempool in other ways can uh, get particularly high fees right now. I think it's probably about 100 bucks right now per transaction mined. And uh, I've had donations from people to go and fund this. There's, uh, there's a lot of people who really want full RBF to happen because it simplifies a lot of stuff. So that's, that's how it is. Any more? Well, so you might want to check on GitHub. I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember there being a config option that just got merged for um, ra Raspberry Pi Blitz to make it easy to do. I, I know for sure on uh, Umbral um, that recently got added, so it's just a check. Where not Umbral, sorry, um, Start Nine recently got added, so so it will be just a checkbox and you know their configuration UI somewhere. Now, like I say, I mean, if you do this. There's not a guarantee you'll be connected to another full RBF node, but once we get past that, you know, that threshold, it just becomes more and more likely. So certainly enabling it on your Raspberry Pi will uh, help things. And, you know, in particular, for things like uh, Rasplit, Start9, I think Umbral as well, a lot of these things do um, Tor by default. So like all the connections, or at least incoming ones, if not all the connections are over Tor, and doing the trick of just connecting to all the nodes is harder on Tor because Tor is kind of screwy and slow. So especially people running full RBF nodes on Tor makes a difference for that subset of the network. You know, it's easy to go and get propagation to work on IPv4 because IPv4 is reliable. You know, but Tor, it's, it's trickier. And same would apply to I2P, although I don't think very many people run I2P nodes. So on Bitcoin Core, it's quite, you know, it's not easy to figure this out. Um, you would have to do something active where you would, you know, send the node um, replacement transactions, see if they get rejected. But on the preferential peering patch, it explicitly advertises it. So that is this thing. Yeah, yeah, and also Bitcoin Knots. Um, so. I think you just came in. So the preferential peering thing, you know, ensures you're connected to other nodes, and then the service bit just advertises it. So Bitcoin knots will advertise the fact it's, um, you know, it's full RBF. But yeah, Bitcoin Core, it's not trivial to figure out. On the other hand, I mean, if you're connected to a node, obviously you can just go wait for full RBF replacements to happen, just see if they came to you. So. You know, the, and, you know, frankly, the, like, there's no way to avoid this if you're thinking about attacks. And certainly if someone really wants to go screw with full RBF nodes, they could start doing stuff like this. But of course, when that, that starts to happen, it really tells miners, hey, could you please go mine full RBF so we just get rid of this nonsense immediately? <laughs> uh, like, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus a few more fixes by... Uh, I wish I remember the guy's name. Sorry, but you know, it, there's like f two or three more fixes by someone else, plus an I fix some minor details. But yeah, a Antoine did the the main work on that, and I have earlier branches where I did something similar, but he he rewrote it from scratch because you know since like since 2016 when I last made one of those branches, all the net handling code has changed. Well, funny enough, like, so I, I mentioned earlier how I, it looks like one miner will be um, turning this on very shortly. You know, I mean, supposedly they have it on right now, so the next block they find will will find that out. But 
Um, prior to that, when the mempool was full, curiously I noticed F2 pool seemed to be the ones most likely to go and mine full RBF. Because, you know, obviously as the mempool gets full, you know, transactions get dropped, but F2 pool seemed to be doing that when the mempool wasn't at the 300 megs limit, and I'm not really sure what was happening there. Um, they might have been experimenting with full RBF. It's possible they had a different uh, mempool size limit than other nodes, which would mean they would do this earlier. Um, in one case, I believe they probably just restarted a node or installed a new one and thus didn't have a full mempool. And it just happened to be when they did that, one of the full RBF nodes did broadcast a transaction to them. But, you know, it's, it's hard to know because after all, the mempool isn't consensus. So, you know, you can't really assume too much based on what miners actually mine. And, and, you know, and, and along those lines, I'll, um, I don't think I pointed it out yet, but remember, you can always go do double spends by just broadcasting multiple simultaneous versions of transaction with the same size and fee. Because there is no reasonable way to go pick between one and the other. And currently, like, Bitcoin just doesn't even try. You know, if it receives a transaction that's the same size and fee as the, you know, one it's evaluating, it'll do nothing. Because replacing it would just mean um, you could go and you know, use up bandwidth on the network without cost. What does it mean to do nothing? I mean, with current Bitcoin Core, yeah, would just delete it from, I mean, it doesn't even add it to mempool. Like, literally, that piece of data just gets deleted and, you know, it accepts it again. Um, in the future, there, there are potential, like, possibilities to um, add this to package relay. Like, if you've heard the term package relay, it basically says, you know, rather than look at transactions one at a time, we look at transactions as a package. So, you know, a classic example why this is useful is in Lightning, the commitment transaction that you need to get mined if your peer disappears, well, the fee might be too low to get into mempool. And currently, this is a real problem because even though you can use child pays for parent to make it worthwhile to mine, if you can't broadcast the first transaction, you can't tell miners it's worth mining. So the package relay proposal that uh, Glory is working on is to, at, you know, at the tech level, to take the orphan pool, which is transactions you receive but can't you know, connect, like you, know, you, you don't have the um, inputs, and reuse that uh, for package relay. So you would add it to a per peer orphan pool. And then when the second transaction comes in, you say, hey, oh, hang on, now it was worth mining. All right, now I'll tell my peers about this. So something similar could be you know, done in this, um, in this case of like divergent transactions too. Well, thank you.